Hello Brain Shakers, welcome to the Brain Shakers Academy. Brave LSD is here. In today's session, we're going to be looking at the types of the female pelvis. Now, the pelvis, or rather the female pelvis, comes in different forms depending on how the bones are well aligned together and whether the bones are actually folding inwardly that is affecting the diameters of the pelvic brim. Now, I have looked at the female pelvis or the applied anatomy in a separate video, and if you haven't looked at that video, please do check out on that video on my YouTube channel, which is the Brain Shakers Academy. Now, let's look at these four diagrams that I have put here to clearly just represent the pelvic brim of the different types of the female pelvis that we're going to have. So basically, we have about four types of the female pelvis, and the one that we have looked at in the previous series on the female pelvis is the one that we're referring to as a gynecoid type of a pelvis. Now, that type of a pelvis is what you would want to find or rather the one type of pelvis that is going to allow the process of childbirth or delivery and labor to progress with minimal problems. So what you're going to have then here is the first one is a representation of the gynecoid pelvis and so we're going to call it the gynecoid pelvis. Okay, so if you look at the gynecoid pelvis, this is basically the pelvic brim and we have looked at the applied anatomy of the female pelvis. If you haven't, please do check out for that video. So this is a more roomier uh, pelvis and you'll find that the ischial spines even when you look at them they are not prominent like this they are well-rounded type of ischial spines that you find in here the sacral promontory is not protruding that much and you find that the the uh, ischial spines will also be blunt Okay, so you have a sacral promontory that is not deviating so much into the inner part and you find that the ischial spines as well, they are not that prominent. You have a curved uh, sacrum that is forming the cave of Karas as well. And on the outlet here, as you look at the outer um, the outlet, you find that the subpubic angle here is going to be at least 90 degrees. Okay, so it is not going to be anything smaller than that. So that will give you a gynecoid pelvis. And with this one, the fetus is going to come and present or rather engage into any diameter and it has the capacity to allow labor to progress without any problems. Okay, then we have this type of a pelvis. Now this type of a pelvis is what we refer to as an android pelvis. Now an android pelvis is referred to as a masculine type of a pelvis. Why? Because in most cases you will find it in men. Now you will still find it in women usually of shorter stature and kind of heavily uh, <coughs> built. But when you look at this we can label now and call it the android. Okay. The android uh, pelvis. Okay, so with the android pelvis, what you see is that it is kind of heart shaped, meaning that you have you can have a sacral promontory that is not prominent, but then the sacrum there forms is a straight um, uh, sacrum there, and then this is going to then appear more or less like a funnel. So it will have a deeper pelvic cavity, but then the sacrum is not coming as a well curved sacrum. It appears rather more straight and then forms what is going to be referred to as a funnel. And then you also notice that in here, the ischial spines are going to be more prominent. Now, if the ischial spines are going to be more prominent, then this is going to affect the long rotation. So if the fetus is presenting into what we call an occipital posterior position, it will, during the process of labor, try to make a long rotation so that it can now come into the direct occipital anterior position. But when you have a type of pelvis like the Android pelvis, what is going to happen is that as that fetus is trying to make that long rotation, it will find the resistance 
existence of these prominent ischiospines in Android, and then that fetus will now be arrested into what we call a transverse diameter. So the fetus can no longer continue its long rotation, and then you end up with what we call a deep transverse arrest or a DTA. That is not allowing the process of long rotation to be completed. So basically that is what you're going to see. And when you look at the subpubic angle here, the subpubic angle is going to be less than 90 degrees. So here it is going to be greater than 90 degrees or at least 90 degrees. So that is our second uh, form or type of pelvis. Now let's look at the third type. The third type is what we're going to call the anthropoid type of the pelvis. So this is called anthropoid type of a pelvis. So the pelvic brim is going to appear like this. You may have a, um, a sacral promontory here that is not prominent, but you have a more longer uh, pelvic brim because you find that the transverse diameter now kind of reduces and what you have longer is going to be the anterior posterior diameter is going to be a more deeper uh, type of pelvis and when you find this type of pelvis you find that the ischiospines in here are going to be blunt and it will still allow labor and childbirth to then proceed without any problems but because it has a longer type of a pelvic brim and it has a wider subpubic angle which is greater than 90 degrees what is going to happen is that it will favor positions such as a deep uh, or a direct occipital anterior position or a direct occipital posterior position meaning the occiput will either be here or on this side and it will not favor uh, or favor the uh, other anterior position so it's either it's on the anterior or it's on the posterior aspect and then labor would be able to uh, proceed in that manner so it has a more longer pelvic brim as compared to it um, uh, having uh, a shorter uh, transverse uh, diameter. So that is the third type of uh, pelvis. Then we can look at the fourth type of a pelvis, which we refer to as a platypeloid pelvis. So this we will refer to as a platypeloid type of uh, pelvis. Now, in reference to a platypeloid type of a pelvis, you will find that you have a sacral promontory that is pushed a little bit forward, meaning that it is coming into the pelvic brim, thereby then reducing the anterior posterior diameter. So this diameter from here to this other end is going to reduce because the sacral promontory is leaning forward. And then what happens is that you have a wider transverse diameter. So because of that sacral promontory coming into or leaning into the pelvic brim, it will then give you what is referred to as a kidney shape or a bean shaped type of a pelvis. Now, labor can still progress with this type of a pelvis, but then it means that the presenting part or the fetal head will have to engage into a platypeloid pelvis in the transverse diameter, meaning that the fetal head will have to engage in this diameter. Because if it engages in this diameter, this has been massively reduced by this uh, sacral promontory that is leaning uh, forward. So this is also going to be a shallow um, type of pelvis, meaning that the cavity is going to be shallow. And once the fetus engages into the transverse diameter, labor can then progress and it will culminate into um, a delivery that is um, unproblematic. Then this, you find that the subpubic arc here is also going to be wider and will be more than 90 degrees. Now, it is very difficult to ascertain what type of a pelvis one has unless you do an assessment. And this assessment is what we refer to as a pelvic adequate assessment. And also you can do ultrasounds to determine the size of the pelvis and x-rays where you do external pelvimetry just to ascertain the type of the pelvis and look at the actual structure or the bones of the pelvis to see if there is any deviation of those bones towards or the in inner part of the pelvic brim then affecting the pelvic diameters. Now, what are some of the things that could be helpful in trying to ascertain whether you are 
having um, a pelvis that is not adequate for the um, uh, fetus because you need to understand that when you have uh, the process of labor or childbirth you're looking at the fetus as the passenger and then looking at the pelvis as the passage so is this passenger going to be able to pass uh, through the passage so you're going to do as you do your vaginal examination you do a pelvic uh, adequacy assessment that is number one you'll be looking at the sacral promontory can you reach the sacral promontory, okay? So in a normal case, we would not want you to reach the sacral promontory because it means that the diagonal conjugate there is kind of compromised. Then if you have done your assessment on the sacral promontory, is it prominent, is it not well, um, is it not uh, prominent? Then from the sacral promontory, you will be coming down. So you have the sacral promontory on that end. Then you have the uh, sacrum. So that is your sacral promontory. And then you have your sacrum on the other end. Come through the hole of the sacrum. Okay, is the sacrum well kept or is it a straight sacrum as you would see in an android um, type of pelvis? Then this will give it a more uh, funnel shaped uh, uh, pelvis. So you're looking also at the hollow of the sacrum. From the hollow of the sacrum, you'll be looking at the ischial spines. Are the ischial spines prominent? Because this is when you also be ascertaining the station. You need to ascertain how high is the presenting part then you would be feeling for the ischial spines as well to determine on whether those ischial spines are prominent or they are well-rounded. Once you have made that assessment of the ischial spines, you have to then make an assessment of what we refer to as the subpubic angle, okay, which is the subpubic arc, okay, which we have been referring to as the 90 uh, degrees angle that we're looking at. So if you look at the ischial tuberosity here, and you have those ischial tuberosity. So you're looking at basically this area outside as you come uh, um uh, as you as you as you come outside, so these are going to be the ischiotuberosities uh, down. So if you're looking at the pelvis from that lower uh bit where the vagina is then as you do that assessment you want to be able to put at least two fingers it should be able to accommodate two fingers in between there then that will tell you that the angle is adequate then as you come out of the vagina then you have to make an assessment of what we call an intertuberous uh, space. So the intertuberous space or the intertuberous diameter is just basically from one thigh to the other thigh, just in between the vagina. As you come out, you make uh, a fist and then place your fist and then you have it accommodating at least about uh, four knuckles. There's a bit of argument because of the difference also in the sizes of the uh, hands. One will have a smaller hand and then they do that pelvic assessment and then it will be adequate to them. Somebody else with a slightly bigger hand does the assessment and it will not be adequate for them. And that's why if there is an extra x-ray done, which is external pelvimetry, it would be the most ideal to ascertain uh, the state also of the pelvis. So basically those are the four main types of the pelvis and you find that you have a gynecoid, an android, an anthropoid, and a platypeloid type of pelvis. In most cases, they are going to culminate into normal and unproblematic uh, deliveries. Basically, if you've liked this video and it is helpful in understanding those pelvic uh, types and shapes, then do drop me comments in the comments section. I'd like to hear what you say. If any questions arise, please drop the uh, questions in there and we will respond to those uh, questions. Thank you so much for watching and from me, I will see you in the next one.